No woman and no person of color wants to be a token and put into a job that is set up for failure, whether the company or the business unit is destined for failure or whether she is put in the role before she is ready. Nobody wants that. Well-qualified women getting put into those roles can succeed. But the likelihood of that success, because there have historically been so few of us, is much higher when we have a support system that the organization mm -hmm. provides in the form of sponsors and mentors, in the form of a culture that really embraces the uniqueness and the unique characteristics that women bring. When there's a culture of belonging where I feel like I can contribute and it's valued. So those are the types of environments where we know women thrive. And so while we're working on developing the women to overcome the hurdles, we're simultaneously working with the organizations because they have to advance too. Welcome to Dr. Patty Ann's podcast. And today I have a powerhouse of a guest that I cannot wait to introduce you to. But first, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe to this podcast because I know you are going to love the podcast and specifically this episode. So today I have a woman who has pretty much been a leader of the pack before it was fashionable. She is currently the CEO of Linkage and she oversees all the strategic direction and global operations of the leadership development firm. She is passionate about empowering people to succeed and specifically empowering women because all my listeners know, not as an excuse, but as a reality, we as women face different barriers, different hurdles, and different obstacles on our way up that corporate ladder. So rather than me tell you about this fantastic woman, let me have the distinct pleasure, pleasure of introducing you today to Jennifer McCullen. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming on. Dr. Patty Ann, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. Great, fantastic. So Jennifer, Let's, I, as I told you right before we started, I like to really make the interviews organic. Like, you know, I don't want to have people hear what they can read about you and what they already know. So I would love for you to start today's conversation sharing with us something about how, how you got to where you are today that most people don't know about. Love it. Um, very few people know that I grew up. And it will just be between the two of us now. So don't worry. It's just between us. Not uh, all the listeners. Oh, really? Okay. Well, then I will tell I'm you. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I will tell whoever wants to hear that I grew up a slightly poor middle class child of two American teachers in Germany. And I spent my first 12 years learning how to be really scrappy because if I wanted something, I had to really do it myself. I moved mm -hmm. to the United mm -hmm. States for the first time in uh, when I was in middle school. Parents do not do that to your child. Because <laughs> well, why did you come? Why did you come to the states? Because did your parents decide to come? Were they? Teaching English as a second language over in Germany, or what were they doing? So th this was in the day when there were still military bases all over Germany, and they needed sure. teachers for the army children as well as the civilian children. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on American army bases at school, but I lived in a German village, so I spoke German and English. And they they came for three years and stayed for fifteen. So my mother, um, who is a very strong woman in her own right, said to my father, I want my children to know the American culture. I am taking them back to the United States. And they plopped us into Florida while I was in middle school. With, with or without you. So you decide, right? <laughs> that was kind of the ultimatum. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Jennifer, um, I am actually really intrigued by that because if what I've learned about you is accurate, uh, my understanding is that you're very fluent in Spanish. I didn't see anything about German. Why not? You did your research. So I spoke fluent German as a 12-year-old. Then I started studying Spanish 
over time, I went overseas and studied. I went back to um, Scotland for my master's degree. I worked in Spain during the Barcelona Olympics in 1992. And I lived in South America in Chile, in Santiago, where I became better and better at living and working and speaking in Spanish, while my German never got much better than the 12-year-old level. Um, but when I plopped into the United States for the first time as, um, you know, as a full-time student, I, uh, it was a really rude awakening for me. And I think that was, you know, all of us are shaped by our upbringing, but that feeling of not belonging, not being, you know, not understanding the culture, not understanding the, the cool clothing, not carrying myself with confidence. It took me a long time across middle school and high school to really come into my own and realize that if I wanted it, um, you know, whether it took money or ambition, I was going to get it, and I had to. I had to go at it on my own. I, I, I had very loving, uh, very loving family, but they didn't have um, the experiences that I needed to make my way mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. I, that 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 is so interesting. So, out of all the cultural shocks, what was the most difficult for you to to learn to assimilate to? I guess is the right way to say it. Right, and you're how old at this point? Um, I was 12. And so, so on uh, the precipice of being a teenage girl, which yeah. under the best of circumstances is a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think actually the hardest thing was um, kind of stepping into my own power and confidence. So I didn't have the social and support structures. I was a gifted athlete and student, but I didn't have, you know, I, I wasn't surrounded by either, you know, friends or colleagues that, you know, students that kind of took me in naturally. So it took me a couple years and it took coach Judy Lister. And um, I have been in touch with her for many decades since. And she took me under her wing and said, this is going to be hard for you, but I am going to help you join my basketball team. She was my basketball coach. And across the course of eighth grade, all the way to my senior year in high school, I became a basketball star. And it was only because I had that support system around me. And I have taken that with me, especially as a woman leader, um, all the way through now into my 50s. Oh, that's so kudos to Judy. I, I'm struck by that because where I grew up, um, again, no money similar, but my father was still alive at the time. And he started the athletic program where we grew up. And since his three oldest of his five children were girls, we actually had sports for us and we started a basketball team and my mother knew nothing about basketball. And I can remember to this day, her dragging the five of us to the public library and getting the equivalent to basketball for dummies, how to coach basketball for dummies. And our friends will tell us that my mother was their first basketball coach and how they learned and coach is a loose interpretation of the term, I'm sure. <laughs> but how they learned so much about life from that. And and I do wanna I do wanna touch on your sports career and leadership because I have found I know when I see someone has been an athlete on any level, it's it's also not that different than the military. I feel like they have certain attributes, certain traits that will make them a better leader. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Because that's your whole life's work pretty much, right? I'm actually so glad you raised that because in the book, I actually did a little bit research about, you know, are there specific characteristics of women mm -hmm. who rise to the top? And mm -hmm. athlete is one of the biggest indicators. And there are so many college athletes who are now CEOs. And part right. of the- uh, Title IX, thank you, Title IX. Well, love Title IX, but also part of it was it is that women, especially of my generation and yours, needed to assimilate to you know really succeed at the top. And that competitive and that competitive nature, the drive, the ambition, um, that will the discipline, to win, the discipline, the discipline, you know, really rises to the top with with any with any athlete. And um, I was I, I'll never forget. Um, it was my uh, my junior year, and Coach Carrie Patrick didn't no, believe junior me. in high school. Your high school, junior, yeah. So now I'm in high school, okay. and I have all of okay. this potential to thrive as a basketball player. But now, where Coach in the states are you living? 
Uh, I was in Florida, Winter Park Florida. High School. Okay. And it's it's one of the largest schools in the state. So we were in the like the 4A or the 5A, the, the, the largest division. And um, we had a fantastic team. But I always I was always in my junior year, kind of off the bench, number six or seven. And I okay. wasn't starting. And Carrie Patrick was very critical of me, like kind of in your face and yelling. And I would go home every night incredibly discouraged. And unlike your father, I, I, my father at some point said, why are you doing this to yourself? Why don't you just quit? And that was kind of what I needed to say, oh, no, not only am I not quitting, I am going to show Coach Patrick that I have got what it takes to be the MVP. And we won the state championship my senior year, and I was the MVP. Oh, my gosh. I think your father was playing reverse psychology on you. Maybe he's actually he's embarrassed. He told me later he's embarrassed that that story was in the book because he really was wanting me to quit. <laughs> I was crying well, and I was upset and de- depressed, and I thought, uh, uh-uh, uh. Okay. I'm so, uh, so, 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 let me ask you this: Do you think if you were a boy, he would have said that to, he would have wanted you to quit? Fascinating. Uh, my brother was also a very intense athlete. He actually went to mm-hmm. uh, to to Harvard to play football. And oh, I, I, I might do... not. I'll talk to you later. I think I know someone that played with him then. Oh, really? If I'm dating it um, right, yeah. I I don't ever remember my brother wanting to quit, but I also don't remember having any heart to heart conversations with either parent. It was almost mm-hmm. like a foregone conclusion that he was going to do this. Whereas I, mm-hmm. and this is actually very. Um, you know, we talk about the the inner critic that women, mm-hmm. you know, everybody has an inner critic, but the woman's mm-hmm. inner critic tends to be louder. So that yeah, it works all the my, time. It works all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think that voice in my head of, you know, who do I think I am to be a basketball star? I'm, I'm not going to make it anyway. And I had to kind of summon that, that kind of inner, inner courage um, even in the in the uh, in great obstacles, whether it was my father or Coach Patrick, to say no, I'm going to show the world that I can do this. So, how do you then take that determination, that mindset, and how did you extrapolate that for all the leadership skills that you teach in your recent book, in her own voice, "A Woman's Rise to CEO," because. There's not many people, if you look at the numbers that become CEOs, men or women, and there's even a smaller percentage that are women, for all the reasons we know that get in our way that, honestly, Jennifer, sometimes I feel like those are excuses, like you have reasons or you have results, which is not to say that some of them aren't legit, right? But how do you extrapolate what you learned about competition and being a winner as an athlete to being to competition? and being a winner in the corporate world. Yeah, I, I wanna be really clear. So our, our linkage research shows that to, be, to become an effective, what we call a purposeful leader, it actually, it, like, gender does not play a role in that. Um, when we mm-hmm. look at, we call it the five commitments of purposeful leadership to inspire, to engage, to mm-hmm. innovate, to achieve, and then to become, which is the self-awareness piece. Actually, when we look at all of our data, women fare very well on all of the commitments and the underlying practices mm-hmm. to effective mm-hmm. leadership. So when mm-hmm. we do I when we do our work, and you called it, you know, you called it there, there are very few CEOs, but there are far fewer women CEOs in the Fortune 500. There are it's 10%, and we just crossed the 10% barrier this year. I didn't even know it was that high. I, I thought it was, and then I thought it dropped. Okay. Well, we just we just lost one, the CEO of, of Walgreens. And it was a woman of color. So there's there's 10%. We just crossed that barrier. So you can celebrate a little. But now there are as many women CEOs of the Fortune 500 as there are men named John. So Isn't that interesting? So you can take a pause there and just kind of scratch your head and say, we are definitely not there yet. And when, it, when it's women, it comes to women of color, there were five and now there are four. So we have a long- For some reason, to- I thought the common CEO male name was Michael. I don't know why. I thought it was Michael. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to do that research after this call. It's probably men named Michael or men named John. We've got more of those than we have women. Okay. But I tell oh, you, but Jennifer, that. but hang on one second. Oh, yeah, okay, but, but hang on one second, though. What you're so I understand what you're saying about the commitment. And of course, of course, 
I would say, of course, what it takes to become a CEO, to become a leader is the same. Of course, the, the qualities, the attributes don't change. So what is different for women then? Exactly. So um, this is what I love about the 25 years of data we've been gather gathering through assessments and experiences through developing mm -hmm. and coaching women is that when it comes to the path to rise across levels of leadership, that's where we see the biggest differences. Now, you said an important thing mm -hmm. earlier. You said, sometimes I think it's excuses. Um, I would say there are there are two reasons for that. One, there are very real external biases that we have to acknowledge, whether it's mm -hmm. pay inequity, whether it's similarity bias, where you're promoting and um, making sure that you get stretch experiences or attracting people who look like you. Um, so right. are there? there's the promotion potential bias where... Um, uh, sorry, the performance potential bias, where women by and large have higher performance scores, men have higher potential scores, which are more subjective, right. and promotion is really based on potential. So there is external bias. We can acknowledge it. We can help organizations become aware of it through organizational assessments and through organizational initiatives. But we women also have to do the work. The rise to leadership is different for us. We face mm -hmm. hurdles that we can't overcome on our path to leadership. The first hurdle is that underlying inner critic. We also hold internal biases, and I'll give you lots of examples. So hang on one second. So so you feel, you feel that, I just want cl a clarification. So you feel that the inner critic, the internal inner, crit, inner critic for a woman is stronger than for a man, or the man is allowed it to... Like, do, I, I do think, you think it's different? I do. And I think for women, it, you do. it prevents us from taking action. Um, it okay, from raising our hands. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we, we have nine out of 10 qualifications and, for a yeah, job exactly. and we don't apply. The man and has it, one, but he's got it going on. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. And, and I think, I mean, I'll tell you a really specific example. Um, before, I took, before I took the CEO job, at Linkage, and I had a headhunter from one of the largest um, search firms in the world approach me for it. My inner critic went crazy, and it sounded like this: you know, "I'm not ready for a CEO job. I need to be a number two before I can be the CEO, so I can be properly groomed. I haven't run the P&L down to the net income line, only to the gross margin line. I can't be the kind of mom I want to be." It was blah blah blah. Two mm -hmm. men in my network who were peers of mine at the former publicly traded company, CEB, before it was bought by Gartner, literally mm -hmm. sat me down and had an intervention and said, listen, all three of us are going after PE-backed -E CEO jobs right now. Why is it that we think we're ready for the CEO job, but you don't? And when I got down to it, it was that inner critic combined with some mm -hmm. real internal biases that I was holding about myself, like I can't be a CEO and be the kind of mom I want to be, or mm -hmm. I can't be a CEO until I have CEO experience or am groomed by someone mm -hmm. else. Those men did not hold those biases at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You, so, you, so you're you talking about it? the critic. Um, I don't disagree with it. But I just I just feel like um, the, the 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 whatever the man doesn't have, and I'm not a he against she world. I mean, we're all in this together. Like I don't like the victimhood thing at all. But I feel like that for men, things are brushed over, right? Like like if you may, if you go to a, a, a meeting, I am sure you've seen this. Like. I actually, I can't wait to ask you about Corn Ferry because I feel like that's such a male old school kind of company. Um, and, um, you know, two people made, a man and a woman made a $20 million mistake, right? The woman's like, all right, I just want to tell you about my mistake, right? And maybe the people that didn't know, now they all know. If you're in a meeting and the CEO goes, all right, John, about that $20 million mistake, yeah, well, we're, we're, okay, moving on. Like they minimize it. They quiet it. They don't highlight it. I feel like sometimes women highlight what a lack of perfection 
And I and I think that's also part of it. And I think that plays to the inner critic, I think. And let's actually take the other side of that. So you're saying like women are maybe a little bit too quick to admit error. And I would say actually women are also not quick enough to self-promote. So uh, what, agree a hundred percent. And mm-hmm. so I have watched throughout my entire career, and and there are good reasons for this, by the way. There's research-backed, you know, reasons where when women are too self-promotional, they actually yeah, they're not get, liked. get beaten down and they're not liked. But yeah. for men, it actually mm-hmm. is far more accepted. So what we have mm-hmm. internalized over time is, you know, I can't stand out, I can't speak up, I can't self-promote. And then that what we call recognized confidence, either we're not feeling confident with that whole imposter syndrome, or if we've done something fabulous, we don't feel like we can share it appropriately with others. And so we teach women the value of appropriate self-promotion as opposed to the deferential nature. It happens every time. If, as, mm-hmm. soon as, you, as soon as you highlight a woman's accomplishments, what does she do? She jumps right in and says, oh, it wasn't me. It was the whole team. And they'll, she'll yeah. take that spotlight off herself. Men actually do a much better job at saying, actually, look at me. I'm doing a really mm-hmm. good job. Yeah, I, I, that I agree with. I mean, in my second book where I was t- teaching women to negotiate, the whole concept of the good girl syndrome, right? Like, God forbid it's perceived that you're working for money. I'm like, oh, really? Everyone on the planet's working for money. And men unabashedly will tell you that you know, no man ever thinks he's overpaid. And I know plenty of them that are, right? So, so there's that aspect. What I have found though, and it's interesting because I never suffered from that. Like I never suffered from the not to be a peacock and show your feathers if it's legit. Of course, there's a way to do it. But what I have found very helpful, and I, I want to know, it, I'd like you to speak to this is, I want women, like you said, in her own voice. I want them to have their own voice. But until they get there, I believe one of the most powerful tools for a woman is to have a male champion, meaning let somebody that's respected, well-respected, be the person that's tooting your horn. And that is very effective. And it's effective for a man too. Do you, how do you feel about that? You're hitting it so many important things. Like I, I want to come back to making the ask in a moment about the challenges sure. that women have and the backlash they face. But sure. you raised something that I think is so critical. And every single time I give a keynote speech, I start by asking anyone in the audience who identifies as a man to raise their hand. Then I ask them to stand up. And then I ask everybody to give them a round of applause. Why? We cannot solve the gender equity gap in our lifetimes without the leadership majority. And 70% of the leadership Mm -hmm. majority at the senior level and above, you know, kind of the the VP level and above is a man and most are white men. They hold the keys to the kingdom. If you want access to the kingdom, got to go to the guys holding the keys. And the vast majority are good guys. They just don't see yes. the role that they could and need to play. So our my mm-hmm. job is to ensure that they see how we all benefit, including them, when we have men lifting us up as sponsors, mentors, and allies. And those are very different mm-hmm. things. What you said, I would call a sponsor. The sponsor mm-hmm. is going to open mm-hmm. the door pull you through mm-hmm. that door and ensure when you get there that you succeed. Because the other thing that And they're putting their you, reputation on the line. They yeah, are. that's right. Jennifer, she's the person for the job. I'm g- giving you my word. I'm, g- I'm staking my reputation on you. That's on right. You. And I'll tell, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, it, it doesn't have to, it, it, it could be for money. It could be for position or promotion or stretch experience. It could be for access to network. And um, in my case, mm-hmm. I had an incredible white man on my board. Well, they were all white men on my board when I started at Linkage. And his name Mm -hmm. is Tom Kolditz. And Tom Kolditz looked at me and said, I'm going to help you open the door to a network called the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. And it's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's a group of a couple hundred people that I think can help you and I think can help Linkage. And it was very hard to get into that group. He paved the way. I got in and it was through... Tom Colditz that I met Alan Mulally. Alan Mulally is now my mentor. Mm-hmm. From Ford? 
He was the CEO mm-hmm. of Ford That's and great. Boeing, and he had mentored me mm-hmm. through the crisis, through the through the COVID nineteen crisis across twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. And I credit the saving of the business during that critical time to that group, the Marshall Goldsmith one hundred coaches, who were advising me, and to Alan Malali, who was mentoring me along the way. So, two, okay, so two, I'm so struck men. by what you just said. I, I'm so struck by, by what you just said. I, I And I understand it, but why would you not credit you? So I credit me and the executive team for the execution, but I was dealing okay. with things that I had never done before, right? And in that network, there were people who had laid off a third of the staff, who had recapitalized mm-hmm. the company, who had innovated through crises too. So I was tapping the expertise so that me, along with the executive team, could execute and continue our transformation, despite the fact that our revenues were plummeting, just like most other companies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is a little bit off the topic, but for some reason, it's it's screaming at me. If you if you don't want to go there, you don't have to. As a woman, what do you feel about the the is it the glass cliff? Right. So you come into linkage, you're not there that long. And then we have COVID. It's almost like, okay, let's set Jennifer up for failure. Of course, that's not what happened. But what do you feel about that? Do you think that's legit? So, all right. So we've talked about the glass ceiling or we haven't, but there's, you know, we often talk about the glass ceiling. Okay. Now, now the woman gets there. Right. Is it a glass cliff when a woman has been placed in a role, especially if perhaps she's not ready or has been properly groomed for the role. And then she goes off. Or, or if the business is on life support. Or the business. Like, on, it's, yeah. It's and that's the, even worse. So I would say that it is, and this is where it's so important that the organization play a role and we can't leave it up to the women to try and solve this ourselves from within it. Mm-hmm. So we need organizations that say, Hey, Jennifer, I'm going to put you in this role. And I know that it's going to be hard and we're going to surround you with the support that you need. And Mm -hmm. when things go wrong, like they certainly went wrong during COVID, we're going to ensure Mm -hmm. that we, we put some booster, you know, some boosters around you and also to support you to succeed. So a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, she just got the job because she's a woman. And, um, wait, people say that, said that about you. No, actually, what people said about me was, I can't believe the private equity board put a woman in the role. We've never had a woman as the CEO of Linkage for 30 years. And my, mm. from my perspective, putting a woman in the role, given that more than half of our business is advancing women leaders, made perfect sense. It mm-hmm. was my mm-hmm. own inner critic and internal bias that was actually preventing me from believing, uh, at least initially before I took the job, that I was ready. Mm-hmm. Um, but But listen, here's what I would say. No woman and no person of color wants to be a token and put into a job that is set up for failure, whether the company or the business unit is destined for failure or whether she is put in the role before she is ready. Nobody wants that. Well-qualified women getting put into those roles can succeed. But the likelihood of that success, because there have historically been so few of us, is much higher when we have a support system that the organization mm-hmm. provides in the form of sponsors and mentors, in the form of a culture that really embraces the uniqueness and the unique characteristics that women bring, when there's a culture of belonging where I feel like I can contribute and it's valued. So those are the types of environments where we know women thrive. And so while we're working on developing the women to overcome the hurdles, we're simultaneously working with the organizations because they have to advance too. Sure. That, of course, of course. All right. Is, I, I'm, I'm so fascinated by the Alan Mulally, um mentor coaching during COVID, right? So what would you say was your biggest takeaway from him that helped you sustain linkage that now you can transcend to every any other situation? I'm going to answer that question, but I want to get back okay. to this making the ask. So two of the hurdles, okay. we can cover sure. both at the same time. And this, I'm going to tell you the Alan Malali story quickly. Okay. So um, 
the two, two of the hurdles that we know women struggle with, one is one of the top three, which is called making the ask. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and the second one is around networking. We know women Mm -hmm. are fantastic at establishing Mm -hmm. relationships, but activating those networks and making specific requests from those networks are way, it's way harder for women than for men. They're willing to help others. They're less willing to ask for help themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was, I'll paint the picture. It was 2020. It was MLK weekend. I was in San Diego. It was my first meeting of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 coaches. It's the first annual gathering. And Marshall Goldsmith and Alan Mulally were doing a workshop on the first day. It was a half day workshop where Alan was teaching us. There were only 100, 150 people there teaching us the secrets to what he called the, or what he calls the working together leadership and management system. He used it at Boeing and he perfected it at Ford and he used it during two of the country's biggest crises through 9-11 when two Boeing airplanes went through the World Trade Center and during the Great Recession um, of 2008 and 9 when he was at Ford and all of the car companies were about to go out of business except Ford. So I watched him across the course of that morning and I couldn't stop thinking about how I needed him to teach me how to use this working together management system, and very specifically what is what was called the BPR, the business plan review, to ensure that every one of my managers and executives on my team were looking together at every critical measure of, of success for the company every single week. And so this is very well documented. You can read about it, but there's this, this mm-hmm. system that's coded red, yellow, green, and it surfaces where the largest challenges are um, and brings groups together to work on them very quickly. So, you know, Alan is on the board of Google, the Mayo Clinic. He's a retired executive. I, you know, that inner critic was, you know, why would Alan help me? You know, how am I even going to get to Alan? Why would he return my calls or emails? So I was in the gym that morning, I was on East Coast time. So it was like five in the morning and I was reading on my iPad, all kinds of articles about Alan. And I just thought to myself, I am going to find a way to get to Alan and I'm going to make the ask. He can always say no. So fast forward about an hour and a half later, now it's, you know, seven o'clock in the morning. And I kind of stumble up to the, you know, the Hyatt executive club where they have the continental breakfast. And I'm sweaty and I've got my phone in one hand and my iPad in another. And I I come in and Alan is standing right there at the toaster. And again, my inner critic goes off. Like, it's not the appropriate time. I haven't practiced. I look horrible. And then I just summoned the courage to say, if not now, when? When? So I walked right up to him introduced myself, talked about what inspired me from the day before, you know, and I can imagine he's looking at this, you know, woman, I'm a private equity. Oh, you were absolutely CEO. memorable. You were absolutely memorable because who goes up to him looking like that? There's no doubt. He's like, Boy, this <laughs> he, was, he, was so, he was so wonderful and, and kind of amused, I think. And he listened to this, this whole thing and he said, yeah, I will help you send me an email. And it wasn't a month later. And then he gave you the card that where his email went to him and not the assistant. So, so I had it. And, um, and this is what's really important about networking. It's always a give and a take. I do as much giving as I can with Alan, Mm -hmm. because I certainly have done my share of taking, but every time I engage with Alan, I spend twice as much time preparing, um, I send really important follow-ups about how things are going. I, I meet people who have been touched by Alan. I take their pictures and I send them to Alan via text. So we've created a, a mentorship relationship, but also a friendship that's lasted across these last four years because I've curated him into my network mm-hmm. and because I had the courage, not only one time, I have made very specific and careful asks of Alan across the last four years. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the takeaway, that one thing. Did, did oh, you, oh, so the takeaway, okay. the, the, so what I learned from Alan was it's not enough. So I had done some fabulous things. I had showed up at Linkage with a very clear commitment to the board about a transformation strategy. So check the box. I had the vision, the aspiration, the strategy, and I was engaging my team around how we were going to transform the company. We also, 18 months in, realized we needed to create the culture 
that would um, allow us to behave in different ways so that we could achieve a very different strategy than Linkage had before. I also had great governance structures with my own team, but also with the board of directors and other stakeholders who were helping. What I didn't have is what pulled it all together. And that was the business plan review. So the business plan review was a brand new structure I put in place after meeting Alan. And um, we flipped the switch the, about two weeks later after Alan gave me very specific guidance about the CEO has to speak the least, the CEO mm -hmm. has to speak last, and the ownership of the metrics are, you know, whether it's sales and revenue, whether it's product innovation, or whether it's employee retention, the owner of the metrics has to ensure that they're collaborating with all of their important stakeholders so when they are reporting red, yellow, and green every single week, we are all looking at the same metrics together and we're agreeing where our biggest challenges were. And that is what saved us during COVID. We came together so quickly. Instead of meeting weekly, we started meeting daily and we could see our, our revenue was falling so precipitously. We need an entire special attention uh, group on how to save and capture. We need to change our contracts to capture and save as much revenue as possible. Then we had a separate, spe separate special attention meeting. How do we accelerate our digital platform? Because if we're going to come out of this alive, we have got to innovate faster. And so that allowed us to really see together what we needed to do to save. And then ultimately, we transformed the company even faster than we would have without COVID. Wow, that's great. And so you still have all of that in place. We do. So we will have, we're, we've now been acquired by Sherm. And so we're mm -hmm. in the, we're at the tail end of the integration and we will run those BPRs until all of the teams are integrated into their various homes at Sherm. Did you want to be acquired by Sherm? So this is such a great story. So I wanted to be acquired because that's the private equity model. So I, the reason right, that's I what you brought in for. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I took the job. I'd, I'd been a business unit leader in several publicly traded companies, but I wanted this experience of transforming a company and taking it to market through the sale and acquisition as the CEO. I knew I couldn't get that, at least at that stage, in a publicly traded company. So this kind of mid-market, small to mid-market companies as a private equity-backed CEO, I knew the drill. So I had committed to the board that we would transform and sell within three to five years. In year four, it was the second year coming out of COVID and our financials were fantastic. And I went to the board and said, I think we should sell now. A recession is looming. Businesses like ours do not fare well during a recession. Let's take the company to market. And if you would have told me then that Sherm would be the buyer, I would have said, that's interesting. They're a nonprofit, we're a for-profit, we're B2B, they're primarily B2C, they serve the HR function, we sell to the HR function, but we serve the business leader. There were enough differences that when Sherm came to the table, I was surprised. But I hadn't been tracking Sherm, they're not a competitor to us, closely for the five previous years. And Sherm itself was transforming their organization. So we were a perfect strategic fit. Mm to help them mm. expand their B2B business, to help expand their the recipients of their products and services beyond the HR function to CEOs, um, executives, and business leaders. Great. Now, you wanted to go back to the ask. I wanted to go back to the ask. Oh, so here's what we know. Women and men equally will make an ask, but women, if told no, will retreat. This isn't me saying this, this is research backed. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Women will retreat much faster and not come back and make mm -hmm. a different form of the ass. Whereas men will stick, stick with it. Now, why do women do that? There's a very real research-based backlash of women asking and asking for what they want. And you said this mm -hmm. earlier, this is that kind of, you know, the, this externalized bias we are perceived as less likable when we do that. So we've been conditioned mm -hmm. over time. Well, I'm going to ask, but I'm only going to ask once. And I'm going to ask for mm -hmm. maybe not what I really want, but that lesser form of what I think I can get. And, and I'm going to so ask really, 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 really nicely. Like not, don't take me seriously, but I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> yeah. And listen, I gave a keynote last week and um, a woman raised her hand and said, I, I, I am the head of talent acquisition at 
X company. And I will tell you that every single time in a like role, if we're giving an offer to a man and a woman, the man is always asking for more than the woman mm-hmm. and always coming back. And my response mm-hmm. to her was, you know, what is the accountability that you in HR need to take to ensure equity and pay? Because we know this is a hurdle that women face. And we know this is an external bias as well. The pay, the pay equity gap after age 40, um, the pay equity gap for white women is about half a million dollars. When you layer on race for African American women, it's about eight hundred thousand, and for Latin women, it's about one point three million. That's the pay disparity once you get past forty in the workforce. That's such a travesty, and it's not only the women's responsibility to become better negotiators. Our organizations have to help us fix that. What, what was her answer? Because I, I find, honestly, I. I sometimes find HR is not, it's, it's really just about protecting the company. I don't think they're protecting the human resources. So what did she say? Because yeah. she's going to tell you, I think she's going to tell you, well, if I can get someone to take less, more power to me, or I don't know. And that was the conversation that we had. And so that is how it started. And then I turned it to the rest of the room. There were several hundred people there. And I said, I said, look, things are changing. I mean, organizations are and HR is driving this in in advanced organizations. They're really looking at pay equity across roles and levels, and they're fixing it. Um, less sophisticated organizations are trying to eke out every bit of savings, and so be it if the woman asks for less. Um, mm-hmm. I had a woman tell me yesterday, I reward every single woman who makes an ask, and I reward her you know, as she comes into my company. And I said, well, what about the women who don't make the ask? And and you know that the woman is worthy of more, a couple thousand dollars, maybe it's twenty thousand dollars. And she said, "Oh no, I don't reward anyone who doesn't make the ask." And I had to think about that because, again, remember, women's conditioning over generations mm-hmm. has been polite. Polite girls don't ask, right? They just mm-hmm. accept. So I think that all of us look. There's, it's never one. It's never only one thing. Well, what did you what did you say that to her? Because I even heard your affect and your tone. She's like, "Oh, I can I can see it. Oh no, I don't reward someone if they don't ask, as if all things are created equal." Yeah, and she's a, you know she's even a slightly older generation than I am in the workforce. And I said, I said, listen, Nancy, I hear you. I mean, she's a hard driving, very successful business executive. I said, but especially at this stage in our career, looking back and seeing the trends across the generations and across the decades, I feel it's my responsibility to support women and even knowing they can make the ask. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I have a different perspective. I think it's our responsibility to help do that. And she said? She disagreed, you know, and and that's, you know, that's, Mm. that's, that's what makes the world go round. But, um, right, right. I'm just at a, I'm at a point in, in my life that I, uh, and in this work that I realized it can't be the women, you know, the women trying to sort it all out themselves. And it can't no, of course be not. the organizations bending over backwards. I mean, organizations mm-hmm. have their priorities as well, but it is going to take both sides of the coin working together. And listen, the very best of our clients, mm-hmm. um, and I'll, I don't know if I can say their name, but I, um, but I'll, it's in the book. So you can, you can read about it. The um, it's an auto parts client. You can say it. You can say uh, it. All right. So I'm I'm a big shout out to, to Tom Greco. He was the CEO of advanced auto and I will never forget this about, about two years ago, they kickstarted a program with us because Tom himself, and he came from uh, Pepsi and Frito-Lay Tom himself said, our le- our leadership does not reflect our customer base. We have such a dearth of women, but a sp- specifically multicultural women, black women, who represent a vast amount of our customer base, and they are nowhere in leadership. And I'm going to fix that. And so we pulled together um, about 35 multicultural women, rising leaders, high potential, high performing women, and 35 sponsors. Tom his entire executive team and the next layer down were all voluntold that they were going to become sponsors. I, you know, linkage said, look, 
just because you anoint someone a sponsor doesn't mean they know how to be a good sponsor. They don't have that capability mm-hmm. set. And Tom said, we're going to train the sponsors and we're going to train the protégés and we're going to come together and we are going to invest mm-hmm. in a multi-year program. So we're tracking the mm-hmm. results of that now, but that's what I love. We are going to work on ourselves as executives and as the organization, and we're going to lift the underrepresented population, in this case, uh, multicultural women. Okay, so I love that. So I'm just be, I'm being conscious of the time, but I might take us off the rails here. But I, I have to ask you this question. I have to ask you this question. So all the gains that women have made and all the research that shows you when you have women, when you have diversity in leadership, when your leadership reflects your customer base, you know, the, num- the, the stats are through the roof. We know this. Having said that, we were told that you can't work from home. I mean, as a working mom her whole life, I remember begging to be able to work from home, right? And then COVID hits and all of a sudden you can work from home. And productivity, the numbers show productivity goes through the roof. Now, all of a sudden, sidebar, because your portfolio shows a significant amount of commercial real estate, whatever those banking firms might be. Now, all of a sudden, oh, no, you can't work from home. You have to be in the office because we have to care about the coffee shop on the corner. Like, really? I don't see the coffee shop on the corner caring about my bills. And the term is the culture. And every time I hear culture, I think, you know, honestly, old white man that wants to control. So how do you address that? What do you think the future is for that? Well, you're you're raising a lot of really important things, and so mm-hmm. uh, you know, let, let let me talk first for women. About, for women, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're you're raising, you know, yeah, the swing back to kind of more of the power residing with the employer versus the employee, which it really was coming mm-hmm. out of you know 2020, mm-hmm. 2021, mm-hmm. is is combined with a perception. If you look at all of the tech companies, you know, even Zoom recently has said, we're all coming back into the office because we're less productive. You can find any study you want that there is more productivity or less productivity, whether you're in office or not. So here's what I would say. What we know is that women, the number one thing they want in their work environment is flexibility. Flexibility. Exactly. Where we work, when we work, how we work. What I don't think is effective is organizations putting a stake in the ground and saying, you know, you will come into the office these three days a week, and then you go into mm-hmm. the office and you're sitting on Zoom calls all day, kind of building up some resentment. Yeah. So we know that the younger generations- um, I can tell you from my clients, there's a lot of resentment, a lot of, not a little, oh, they're driving into work and they are furious. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. And, I, and I, I understand that. And so companies who are serious about attracting and retaining either women Mm -hmm. or Gen Y and Z have to take that into account. The very best companies are being really purposeful about when we come together and why we come. Look, Mm -hmm. I love a good offsite. I love an innovation session. Exactly. I don't. I love them too. I lead them. (laughs) So, so that's what I would say is we know women are demanding flexibility. They also are demanding that companies demonstrate a commitment to inclusion and DEI. They're they're demanding managers who care about the mental health and care about their advancement. We did we did research at SHRM this past year that shows you know men and women are equally apt to tell their managers about what they aspire to. But 71% of men say, yeah, and my manager supports me in getting there and only 61% of women. So again, you see the discrepancy Mm -hmm. in the perception of women versus men about how their companies are supporting them. Mm. Interesting. So it would be so interesting to see what happens. And I think on top of the women issue, I do think there's a generational issue You know, I could say a lot of negative about the younger crowd, but having said that, you know, they saw their parents, you know, work for a company for 19 years and then their parent is eligible for a pension and they get laid off. Not a coincidence. Right. And and so I I think it will be interesting to see how this plays out long term. So thank thank you for sharing that. Um, All right. I just have two more questions and I want you to unabashedly promote yourself, but I do have two more questions. One. 
other than yours, what's the last book you reread and why? Ooh, that's so good. Um, so I love the book, The Hard Things About Hard Things. Um, mm-hmm. Who the heck wrote that book? It's the um, venture capitalist out of California. Um, but what I love yes, about that's that book, okay. I, and I've read it twice, but what I love about it is um, for any for any of us, men or women who are engaged in really tough, it could be transformation, it could be culture, it could be taking a company public. It's it's so funny and it's so wise about what to expect and how to overcome it. So that's number one. And then the, uh, as I mentioned, Marshall Goldsmith before he wrote a book called the earned life and Arthur Brooks wrote Mm -hmm. a book called from strength to strength. And I've been reading both of those books, um, simultaneously because, you know, as you move through your career, you, I'm at a stage where I'm now, I'm now shifting a little bit and making sure that, I am leaving the workforce better for the next generations, just like the women who came before me, the baby boomer women and the women that kind of came up in the 1980s that had to deal with such, you know, you know, such oppression and really free me to be able to do to whatever, whatever I wanted to do. Look, I still had a lot of hurdles, but I've got a 21 year old daughter and I want it to be easier for her. And there's no doubt you're leaving it a better place. There's no doubt. And then my last question to you is, what is the one song that you can't live without? <laughs> oh, I love a good Aretha Franklin. <laughs> Which one? P-E-C-T. P-E-C-T. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> awesome. Yes, we shouldn't give up our day jobs. It's like women's empowerment song. That's, a, that's one of them. <laughs> great, great. Okay, so Jennifer, please. Share with the listeners where they can get your book, where they can learn more about you, unabashedly promote yourself. I love it. So first of all, go to sherm.org backslash in her own voice. And that is Mm -hmm. the, if I can, if I can get it here, I'll turn off the, I'll turn off the background. This book is representative of everything that we know that has changed in the last in the last three or four years since COVID about the acceleration of women in the workplace. It's for any woman who aspires to advance in her career and for any organization who aspires to support them. So I am currently traveling the world on a book tour and a speaker tour to help solve the gender equity crisis. Great. And is there a website you'd like to send people to that's just yours? Uh, I am still the CEO of Linkage. So to find me, you go to, and you can obviously connect with me on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, or Facebook. And I've got a lot of personal stuff there. But if you want to find out more about speaking or Linkage's offerings, you can go to linkageinc.com and learn more about how you can support yourself or your organization in advancing its women leaders and helping all leaders become more purposeful and inclusive. Okay, thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm definitely going to check all of those sites out, especially I'm going to be scrolling because I do want to see a picture of Jennifer in her basketball uniform. I absolutely will be looking for that. So thank you so much. I encourage everybody, please go out, do not walk, run to get Jennifer's in her own voice. She has wisdom that you will not find anywhere else from the best of the best. And that concludes today's podcast episode of Dr. Patty Ann's podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And as I mentioned earlier, I knew you were going to love this interview. (laughs) So make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. And until next time, be well. Thank you.